Hey. Um. Oh, hang on for a second. Hey, guys. If anyone's checking in. Um, I'm a few minutes late. Very sorry. I was just... Um, I was just getting sorted and getting together um, behind constantly. Um, hey, guys. Everyone arriving. How's it going? I hope your week has been nice and happy Friday. Um, if your week has not been nice, it's nearly over, which is good. If it has been nice, great, and it's it's celebrated. It's nearly over. Um, and you guys are kind of popping in. I have a few poems. I'm a bit more organized this time around, so I will be able to um, read a bit more fluidly to you. Yeah. So where to begin? Um, I know I, I did see a tweet. Um, I'm not off Twitter just yet, but I did see a tweet somebody saying about Orpheus. So hopefully we can read you a bit of the Ovid's telling of, of the Orpheus and Eurydice story. Uh, but I hope you're well. I'm going to crack straight into it. And I'm sorry I am a few minutes late. But I hope you guys are good. What do I have here? I might start with um, Chamisini. And there was loads. I mean, I could... I'm such a huge Heaney fan. I could go for ages and ages. Um, but I have two that are quite nice too. This is District and Circle. Um, this is from District and Circle. I will read the actual poem District and Circle. But this is Hoffen, which I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. It's a glacier in, uh, in Norway, I believe, or in Scandinavia. Hoffen. The three-tongued glacier has begun to melt. What will we do, they ask, when boulder milt comes wallowing across the delta flats and the miles deep shag ice makes its move? I saw it rigid and rock-set from above, undead grey-gristed earth pelt, eon scruff, and feared its coldness that still seemed enough to ice-block the plain window dimmed with breath, deep-freeze the seep of adamantine tilth, and every warm, mouth-watering word of mouth. It's a lovely one. Um, hey, 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 guys. Welcome, welcome. Sorry I was late today. I'm starting to see you guys saying, hey, I see you. I see you. Um, District and Circle is, if you're from London or you're familiar with if you're from the UK, you're, you're in London. District and Circle is a... Uh, it's to do with the underground, the London underground system. It's a... Uh, one of their routes, as it were, routes. Um, and this is a lovely one, and it's kind of about experience of, of him. His early experiences in London and... and, and kind of measuring up the experience of, of being in the underground, him coming from quite a rural background. And I suppose uh, the feeling of, a certain feeling of outs outsiderness as, as an Irish person in, in London. District and Circle. Tunes from a tin whistle underground curled up a corridor I'd be walking down to where I f knew... I was always going to find my watcher on the tiles, cap by his side, his fingers perked, his two eyes eyeing me in an unaccusing look I'd not avoid, or not just yet, since both were out to sea for ourselves. As the music larked and capered, I'd trigger and untrigger a hot coin held at the ready. But now my gaze was lowered, for was our traffic not in recognition? A corded passage, I would repocket and nod, and he, still eyeing me, would also nod. Posted, eyes front, 
along the dreamy ramparts of escalators ascending and descending to a monotonous slight rocking in the works, we were moved along, upstanding. Elsewhere, underneath, an engine powered, rumbled, quickened, evened, quieted. The white tiles gleamed. In passages that flowed with draughts from cooler tunnels, I missed the light of all overing, long since mysterious day. Parks at lunchtime, where the sunners lay on body heated, mown grass, regardless. A resurrection scene, minutes before the resurrection. Sorry, I just got a phone call there. Habitués of their garden of delights, of staggered summer. I'm going to go back a line. Uh, in passages that flowed with draughts from cooler tunnels, I missed the light of all overing long since mysterious day. Parks at lunchtime where the sunners lay, on body heated mown grass regardless. A resurrection scene, minutes before the resurrection. Habitués of their garden of delights, of staggered summer. Another level down, the platform thronged. I re-entered the safety of numbers. A crowd half straggle raveled and half strung like a human chain. The pushy newcomers jostling and purling underneath the vault. On their marks to be first through the doors. Street loud, then succumbing to herd quiet. Had I betrayed or not myself or him? Always new to me, always familiar. This unrepentant, now repentant turn as I stood waiting, glad of a first tremor. Then, caught up in the now or never whelm of one and all the full length of the train. Stepping onto it across the gap, onto the carriage metal, I reached to, to grab the stubby black roof wart and take my stand from planted ball of heel to heel of hand. A sweet traction and heavy down slump stayed me. I was on my way, well girded, yet on edge, spot rooted, buoyed. Aloof, listening to the dwindling noises off, my back to the unclosed door, the platform empty, and wished it could have lasted. That long between times pause before the bulge and glaze over, when any forwardness was unwelcome, and bodies readjusted, blindsided to themselves and other bodies. So deeper into it, crowd swept, strap hanging, my lofted arm, a swivel like a flail, my father's glazed face in my own waning and craning. Again the growl of shutting doors, the jolt and one-off treble of iron on iron, then a long centrifugal haulage of speed through every dragging socket. And so by night and day to be transported through galleried earth with them, the only relic of all that I belong to, hurtled forward, reflecting in a window mirror-backed by blasted, weeping rock walls, flicker-lit. That is District and Circle uh, by Seamus Heaney. Um, there was a few I was going to read you. By a guy called Stephen Dunn, who's a New York-based poet. I believe he's... Um, I believe he's a Perlitzer Prize-winning poet. That's the wrong book. That's the wrong book. Um, how are you guys doing, by the way? How has your week been? Please read more. James Heaney. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Um... Where have I got you here? Um, yeah, how have you been? I didn't get sticky notes, is the answer to that question. I did not get sticky notes, uh, but I just have paper here. Okay, this is a guy called, this two poems from a guy called Stephen Dunn, from this wonderful collection. Um, one called Sadness, and one called Sweetness. Um, I have to say there's something 
of this sort of stark realism of New York in, in his uh, in his writing. It's, it's, these two leapt out at me, I have to say. Sadness by Stephen Dunn. This is for all the artists and, and writers out there. Sadness. It was everywhere, in the streets and houses, on farms and now in the air itself. It had come from history, and we were history, so it had come from us. I told my artist friends who courted it not to suffer on purpose, not to fall in love with sadness, because it would be naturally theirs without assistance. I had st sad stories of my own, but they made me quiet the way my parents' failures once did. Nobody's business but our own. And besides, what was left to say these days when the unspeakable was out there being spoken, exhausting all sympathy? Yet, feeling it, how difficult to keep the face's curtains closed. She left, he left, they died. The heart rising into the mouth and eyes, everything so basic, so unhistorical at such times. And then, too, the woes of others would get in. But mostly, I was inured and out to make a decent book or in pursuit of some slippery pleasure that was sadness disguised. I found it. It found me. Oh, my artist friends, give it up. Just mix your paints. Stroke. The strokes unmistakably will be yours. And sadness. And sweetness by Stephen Dunn. Sweetness. Just when it has seemed I couldn't bear one more friend waking with a tumour, one more maniac with a perfect reason. Often a sweetness has come and changed nothing in the world except the way I stumbled through it. For a while, lost in the ignorance of loving someone or something, the world shrunk to mouth size, hand size, and never seeming small. I acknowledge there is no sweetness that doesn't leave a stain, no sweetness that's ever sufficiently sweet. Tonight a friend called to say his lover was killed in a car he was driving. His voice was low and guttural. He repeated what he needed to repeat. I repeated the one or two words we have for such grief until we were speaking only in tones. Often a sweetness comes as if on loan, stays just long enough to make sense of what it means to be alive, then returns to its dark source. As for me, I don't care where it's been or what bitter road it's travelled to come so far to taste so good. Isn't that just a beautiful poem? Um, that's Stephen Dunn, American poem, poet, New York-based poet. I believe he's from New York, anyway. Um, where to now? What have I got for you? I could do some Ovid, but it's it's more long form stuff. Actually, that the Orpheus and Eurydice is, is quite. Uh, I could do some T S. I might do some T S Eliot. It's got some kind of underground vibes going on here. Um, between the T S Eliot poem I was going to read you, and the Orpheus line. The T.S. Eliot opens with the Dante. Um, proof Rock opens with the Dante uh, excerpt. Let's do Orpheus, because I did see a, a tweet about that. And um, There's one thing at the end of it, which I believe Orpheus characterises, or he kind of describes and plays around with, which I don't believe was in, as I understand it, in other earlier ed depictions of, of Orpheus. I think it's just Ovid being um, cheeky. It hasn't aged well in the last 2,000 years, I have to say. Um, good luck. 
Orpheus and Eurydice. Hymen, the god of the marriage feast, in his robes of saffron, flew from Crete through the measureless sky to the land of the Thracian Sicones. Orpheus was calling the god to his wedding, though all to no purpose. The god attended, for sure, but the ritual words, the joyful faces and omens of favour were sadly missing. Even the torch in his hand kept sputtering smoke, brought tears to the eyes but never ignited, however strongly he waved it. The outcome was even worse than foreshadowed. The newly wed bride, while taking a stroll through the grass with her band of attendant naiads, suddenly fell down dead with the fangs of a snake in her ankle. When Orpheus, the Thracian bard, had indulged his grief to the full in the air above, he felt he must also appeal to the shades and dared to descend to the river Styx through the Tenarian gateway. That should be Tyanaran gateway, I suppose. Yeah. Making his way through the shadowy tribes, and the ghosts of the buried. He came to Proserpina, throned beside the Lord of the Shadows, who rules that dismal domain, and plucking the strings of his lyre, he began, You powers divine of the subterranean kingdom, where all of mortal creation must one day sink to our doom, if you will give me permission to tell you the truth unvarnished by shifty pretenses, I've not come down to explore the murky regions of Tartarus, nor to enchain the three-headed monster, Medusa Boar, the dog whose coat is bristling with adders. I'm here in search of my wife, cut off in the years of her youth when a viper she trampled discharged its venom inside her ankle. I'd hoped to be able to bear my loss and confess that I tried, but love was too strong. That God is well known in the world above, and I wonder whether you know him here. I divine that you do. If rumour has not invented the tale of that old abduction, you too are united by love. In the name of these confines of fear, in the name of this vast abyss and your realm of infinite silence, I, Orpheus, implore you, unravel the web of my dear Eurydice's early passing. We all are destined for you. We may tarry a little, but sooner or later we speed to our one habitation. This is the place that we are all bound for, our final dwelling, and yours is the longest reign that the human race must endure. Eurydice too, with her due of years, has been ripely completed shall own your sway. Till then, I beg you to let me enjoy her. If fate forbids you to show my wife any mercy, I'll never return from Hades myself. You may joy in the deaths of us both. As Orpheus pleaded his cause, enhancing his words with his music, he moved the bloodless spirits to tears. For a moment, Tantalus ceased to clutch the fleeting pool. Ixion's wheel was spellbound and vultures halted their pecking at Titios's liver. The Daenads dropped their urns and Sisyphus sat on his boulder. The Furies' hearts were assuaged by the song and the story goes that they wept real tears for the very first time. The king and queen of the world below forbore forbore to refuse such a moving appeal, and they summoned Eurydice, leaving the rest of the ghosts who had newly arrived. She slowly trailed along on her wounded ankle. Orpheus was told he could lead her away on one condition, to walk in front and never look back until he had left the vale of Avernus, of Avernus excuse me, or else the concession would count for nothing. In deadly silence, the two of them followed the upward slope. The track was steep. It was dark and shrouded in thick black mist. Not far to go now, the exit to earth and the light was ahead. 
But Orpheus was frightened. His love was falling behind. He was desperate to see her. He turned and at once she sank back into the dark. She stretched out her arms to him, struggled to feel his hands on her own, but all she was able to catch, poor soul, was the yielding air. And now as she died for the second time, she never complained that her husband had failed her. What could she complain of except that he'd loved her? It's very generous telling, isn't it? She only uttered she only uttered her last farewell so faintly he hardly could hear it. And then she was swept once more to the land of the shadows. Robbed of his wife all over again, poor Orpheus was stunned, like the terrified person who once caught sight of the three headed hellhound Cerberus, chained by the middle neck, and whose fear never left him until his nature had changed and the stone crept over his body. Or poor Lethea, transformed to stone by her pride in her beauty, whose husband Olenus took her offence on himself and hoped to be changed in her place. Two hearts that once were united in love and now are separate rocks on the stony heights of Mount Ida. Orpheus wanted to cross the Styx for a second time, but his pleas were in vain and the ferryman pushed him away from the bank. So he sat there in rags for a week without eating a morsel of food. His anguish, his grief and his tears were all that kept him alive. Cursing the gods of the dark for their cruel unkindness, he finally took himself back to Rhodope's heights and to windswept Hamus. Three years went by with a sun god traversing watery Pisces to mark their ending. Orpheus now would have nothing to do with love of women, perhaps because of his fortune in love, or he may have plighted his troth forever. But scores of women were burning to sleep with the bard, and he suffered the pain, excuse me, they suffered the pain of rejection. Orpheus even started the practice among the Thracian tribes of turning for love to immature males and of plucking a flower of a boy's brief spring before he has come to his manhood. That is the end. Um, it really takes a left turn at the end there, doesn't it? it has not aged well. Um, sorry, apologies. Yeah. And I wish I had... I wish I could give you the context of some of the other uh, comparisons there. The person who, who froze in sight of uh, Cer Cerberus. Um, there's also the death of Orpheus and the reuniting with Eurydice. That's just gruesome. Uh, it's not gruesome. Um, what time are we at? Uh, maybe you have a few more. It's nice. It's a nice telling of a, of a bit more underworld stuff. How about some of this? Um, how are you guys doing? Talk to me. I hope your uh, Friday is going is going good. Yeah, let's do let's do one or two more. I, I have a few more. I think I want to do. Yeah, let's maybe do two more. If we don't get to that, if we can get to that. Okay. That was that was meta somebody asking um, what's the translation? It's 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 metamorphosis. It's Ovid's metamorphosis. Uh, the translation, this one is by uh, David Rayburn. Um, I can't remember why I, I got this one. I think I'd read a few other translations. This is a, quite a recent one. Uh, David Rayburn's translation of metamorphosis. And it's very readable. And it's very vivid, I have to say. Um, I haven't read all of it. I am useless at reading quickly. Um, the Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock is one of my favourite poems of all time. And I will read it. Yeah, it is. It's far more modern. Yeah, it's a very modern um, interpretation. It's very readable. Um, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Now it begins with, with uh, 
with a reference to Dante with two um, triplets. And I won't attempt to read them in Italian. They're presented in Italian. I won't attempt that because it will offend uh, anyone who has even a lick of Italian. Um, but the translation, it translates as, I believe it's from Canto 8, but it translates of, as, uh, as uh, roughly, if I believed that my reply were made to one who could ever climb out into the world again, this tongue of flame would shake no more. But since no soul ever returned, if what I'm told is true, from this blind world into the living light, without fear of dishonour, I'll answer thee. And I think it's, it's, um, it's when Dante meets his kind of mentor figure and asks him how he's ended up there. It's basically, yeah. Um, so we're staying very much under the ground at the moment. Um, yeah. Without fear of infamy, I answer thee. The love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a pe patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels, the sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask, what is it? Let us go and make our visit. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once around about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time. There will be time to prepare a face that to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me, and time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo, and indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare? And do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions that a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I have known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl? And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, 
I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleep so peacefully, smoothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor, here beside you and me, should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head, grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker. I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker, and in short, I was afraid. And would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me, would it have been worth while to have bitten off the matter with a smile? to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it after all, would it have been worthwhile after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this, and so much more? It is impossible to say just what I mean. But as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, that is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two, advise the prince, no doubt, an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious, unmeticulous, full of high sentence, but a bit obtuse, at times, indeed, almost ridiculous, almost at times, the fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows on the, the water, white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. That is... The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. Um, sorry, yeah. I'm flagging a wee bit. Um, there was one more I was going to read. I'll read her one more and then I really got, got to get going. This has been a long, a long sit. It's actually that long. I just, I said I would do, I don't want to let, let this, uh, another person down. I said I'd do a thing. Um, Brendan Kennelly. Um, it's a beautiful poem called Begin. And it's lovely. It's a lovely one. A bit more hopeful than um, some of the other stuff I've thrown at you. Thanks very much for popping in, by the way. And it is wonderful to, uh, to see you all. Um, this is a beaut. This is an evergreen poem. Pardon the, the pun, I suppose. Begin. Begin again to the summoning birds, 
to the sight of light at the window. Begin to the roar of morning traffic all along Pembroke Road. Every beginning is a promise born in light and dying in dark determination and exaltation of springtime flowering the way to work. Begin to the pageant of queuing girls, the arrogant loneliness of swans in the canal bridges linking the past and future, old friends passing through with us still. Begin to the loneliness that cannot end, since it perhaps is what makes us begin. Begin to wonder at unknown faces, at crying birds in the sudden rain, at branches stark in the willing sunlight, at seagulls foraging for bread, at couples sharing a sunny secret alone together while making good. Though we live in a world that dreams of ending, that always seems about to give in, something that will not acknowledge conclusion, insists that we forever begin. That's Brendan Kennelly. Isn't that a lovely one? Isn't that a sweet one? Thank you very much. I might have to leave you there. I might have to love you and leave you, as, as, as they say. Um, I hope you are good and keeping well and staying safe and looking after yourselves and one another. Um, I will keep you... Uh, I'll keep in touch and hopefully we can do this next week. Um, there's a lovely... There's lovely stuff here I'd, I'd read, but some of them aren't exactly poems. But I know those are nicer to sit and, and, and hear and they require less concentration. There's a lovely speech. There's a, maybe if I just take some excerpts out of it. Um, anyway, I hope you're well. It's nice to see you all. Thanks so much for popping on and saying hey. Um, good to hear from you all. And yeah, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the weekend. Um, good night, much love. Okay. Thank you again. Take care.